Recently on the podcast, I had a discussion with a psychologist around ADHD in adults and managing money, doing life, and it really was a bit of a PSA uh, for those who might live with someone that has ADHD, someone going through the diagnosis of having ADHD, and just a look under the hood of how that um, plays out in everyday life. Following on from that, I wanted to jump on and share my own story about my kind of history around this issue and then my diagnosis around this issue and the change that has occurred since having that. Um, So, I'm not really planning too much of this episode out. Um, I really don't think it's going to take more than half an hour to tell my story. It might, uh, but we're talking all things ADHD and my story. My name is Glenn James, and this is Money. Before we start, I do want to preface this episode. Uh, Number one, it is my story only, okay? Anything you hear me say, it's my experience. It is my view. And even if I say something that a medical professional said to me, my wires may be crossed. It might not be 100% accurate. So, don't listen and say, oh, I did that like Glenn. I've automatically got this condition. Um, This is my story and it is more as a a PSA. If some of the things that I do talk about resonate with you, maybe chat with your GP, okay? So, number one, it's my story. Number two, if you aren't interested in this type of topic, I probably wouldn't listen any further because I'm just sharing my own journey around how I've, you know, thought something was up for many years. And then finally in 2024, uh, got an answer and then how I've dealt with that. Um, So, it, it really is probably not really, I guess, money content in terms of how to invest or, you know, how to pay off debt. But what I can share with this uh, episode is how I managed money, uh, being the impulsive spender that I am and, and all that stuff. So, yeah, number two, it's it's really, it might not be relevant for all. I did ask our Facebook group if they wanted me to do this episode because I was like, oh, I'm happy to be honest and open about my experience. But if most people don't care, well, I won't waste my time and I'll literally save my breath. So, of people that we surveyed in the Facebook group said that they would find this helpful. So, I think that's the the main things. One, it's my story. Uh, Two, don't listen if you're not interested in uh, in this type of content. And three, see your own GP always if you have suspicions of issues or anything medically related, all right? I will say- my journey was a long journey and, you know, and I, I, it's weird, like there's a lot going on in the world and I'm always guilty of uh, negative positivity or whatever they call that. But it's like, yeah, probably not heaps big deal. I'm a, you know, wealthy white dude living in Australia. What's your problem? There's a lot of crazy stuff happening in the world that really matters. Uh, but I guess comparing my own self today with my own self yesterday, uh, there certainly was something that needed to be addressed. Okay. So, we're not, this is what I I get stuck in my own head, don't I? So, yeah, this is, we're just going to chat about it. So, what I'll do, I think I'll start by saying for many years, I just even, I'll rewind, like, I've always, I've always said, if I could be good at reading and comprehension, <laughs> I'd be a lawyer because I love, you know, getting into the nuance of stuff and the scenarios and all that stuff. And I've never been a strong reader, uh, which can mean you're not good at comprehending. And it's interesting, like I did some study, um, obviously, with my career, and I think because I am interested in it. I can kind of tolerate a little bit more, like reading all the financial stuff. Um, But even with, like, I've recently done that TAFE thing. Before I was, like, taking the medication for the AHD, in the um, multiple choice question, 
this is and this is some of the sloppy um, mistakes. And I don't think it's dyslexia. I think it is that um, hyperactivity. Just got to move on. Got to get moving. Yep, they'll do. Like it, it could be like uh, answer the following question: A, B, C, or D. Um, what month comes after January? And they might have December, February, March, and July. Okay. Um, so, what month comes after January? And I've picked D. And like, no, that's wrong. Oh, no, I knew that it was February. I just, so that's kind of, <laughs> and it's really embarrassing because there were some basic things in the, some of the little TAFE um, exams that I was doing that I categorically knew the answer to, like 100% knew the answer to, but my mind would just be like, yep, got to get through this. Yeah. What month is it? Yeah. February. Oh. So that had kind of happened my whole life with a range of different things. Now I had always found uh, it hard to read and comprehend and pay attention. And the psychologist that I went to, I went to a neuropsychologist um, and they did a you know a couple of hour assessment with me and then um, went to a psychiatrist to go through that report. But the neuropsychologist said to me, "It sounds like you've like always just had careless mistakes." And I'm like, "Yes, that's like the perfect essence of the word. My my life is summed up as just careless, sloppy mistakes. But I'm not a careless person." And and like, I don't know if some of this stuff is ADHD or not, but I'll give you an example. I had my own business being a financial advisor for over 10 years. And before that, I was a financial advisor. And and before, actually, before I get onto that, I'll, when I was an employee as a financial advisor and power planner in an office, I struggled to hit KPIs because it was like, uh, deep focus work. Like you've got to sit there, you've got to pay attention. And this is an open office area, you know, distractions everywhere. Like, oh, this guy's walking around, this girl's walking around. Like this is just wild. So I was really struggled to have a high output in that role. Uh, and I look back and be like, far out. If I would have had some Ritalin back then, I would have smashed that role. Uh, so it's it, it did start to call problems uh, when I was an employee. And the psychiatrist said to me that, look, being self-employed now uh, and for, you know, many years since 2010, it's probably masked a heap of the issues because if I didn't feel like doing something, I could just not do it and just kind of float around. Uh, so, it had been a problem for a while. But going back to when I had my own business, it's this weird thing that in the ordinary course of life, I would make careless mistakes. Now, one thing with financial advice, lots of numbers, lots of detail, uh, lots on the line, okay? And I, I was looking, I was thinking back the other day, I really didn't make that many careless mistakes when I was a financial advisor, you know, putting wrong amounts in and, you know, deducting two or 20 grand out of a client's bank account instead of $2,000 like extra. But you know what? And this kind of speaks to kind of some of the spending um, and how I've managed money. I knew that I had to really focus with this job or doing this advice document or doing this application or doing this investment trade. And I knew that because I did usually make careless mistakes that I had to be hyper focused and hyper sensitive to, you know, when I was working on client stuff. And for me, I would often be really, really exhausted after a day working as a financial advisor. Now, a lot of people might get really exhausted, but I put that back to because I'd never made uh, any real, you know, careless mistakes of significance or any mistakes that, you know, are, you know, there's always mistakes in human error, but it didn't plague me that, oh, he kept investing the wrong amounts for people. And and we had checks and balances, like if we were going to do an investment uh, in the office um, before you hit trade, you'd get someone else in and they would double check it. So, that was just best practice anyway. But yeah, I just was like, that's interesting looking back. I knew that there was a problem. I knew my proclivity was to be sloppy and not focused. 
And yeah, I would just really heavily concentrate and just be so mentally exhausted after a big day in the office, which I don't really get mentally exhausted like that anymore. Um, so yeah, that was an interesting thing. So that was kind of, you know, if we move now to, I guess I, with the ADHD, with TikTok and Instagram and all that stuff, there is more an awareness out there now. There are people like me, I'm part of this awareness now. I've realized I've had this problem and I've heard someone talk about and I would resonated with some of the things that people said. And I'm like, yeah, that could be a, that could be a thing. So I basically went, um, I knew that you had to get a psychologist referral to actually have this looked at. And I actually, I didn't go to my GP, but I would encourage everyone to go direct to your GP first uh, for a referral if, or just to have some questions answered. Uh, but I went to a private type clinic in Sydney and I won't actually give the name of it because um, one, I don't think it actually matters and I think they may have closed their books since I've booked. Um, but anyway, go to your GP. So I first went to a private clinic and like, hey, I'd like to go through this process and either um, confirm a diagnosis or rule it out because I was quite open to the fact that Oh, these are some of my symptoms. Um, it resonates with me hearing other people's stories about ADHD. I'm happy just to go through this process. And if you think that it is an issue, I'm happy to treat it. If you're like, no, that's fine. I'll get on with my life. I was totally um, okay. I just wanted to kind of confirm or, um, oh, you know, confirm whether I had um, ADHD or not. Weirdly, I think in about 2013, after I'd started my business, because I wasn't, I kind of am kicking myself because I'm not a productive per. I don't feel I'm productive. And I'm just, I went to the doctor in 2013. I don't even know if it was, I don't even know who it was. And I'm like, hey, I'm thinking, is there any way that I can get a, some medication for ADHD? <laughs> like, I, I think I said that to the doctor. And it was an interesting thing, and it probably was more of a that GP may have not have um, been up to speed on all the stuff, and he was pretty much like, "Oh well, you know, you'll have to go to a psychologist and do the thing." And and he said to me like, "Oh, can you like watch a movie without getting distracted?" I'm like, "Yeah, I, yeah, love going to the movies." Like, so, yeah, it might not be so, and that kind of went away. I was a bit annoyed that I didn't continue to just look on that and and I get it like as as I said at the start I, I might be mischaracterizing that um but I, I kind of did scratch this um you know nine years ago or when was it tw uh, 11 years ago rather um so yeah that's um anyway we're here now so I went to the neuropsychologist as part of this private clinic. So their process was not just to go to the psychiatrist, um, they would send you to a neuropsychologist, uh, do the three hour, two and a half or whatever it was, um, booking meeting, then see the psychiatrist and chat about it and, and we can get into that. But what I thought it might be interesting to do, I'm gonna actually read um, the, report that I got back and it's called an ADHD screening assessment report. Um, my name, the date of assessment, it was the end of last year, um, start of November. And I, I, I'll be pretty on it. I'll just read most of it. I think there's one or two lines of things that are hugely private that I actually won't read, uh, but you'll get the idea of, um, the process for me and the report. And then I'll talk to you about the experience with the psychiatrist. Uh, and then I'll, I think we'll then we'll have a break and then I'll talk to you about some of the wild, actually let's do the wild impulsive stuff now because looking back on this, this is so crazy. All right. So 
if you've done the Glenn James spending plan, that plan, it was born realistically me noting I had a problem in my life with spending. And it's just like you can be a spender or saver, but then you can be like hugely impulsive, right? And I think I've even called this episode, um, what am I going to call it? I'm just going to bring up the thing. Um, riveting podcast content, this, isn't it? Yeah. I'm calling this episode, I was an impulsive buyer and not a mindful spender. And it just speaks to like exactly what I was. I was so impulsive with so many things in my life. It was so disruptive. And financially, I would I just in my early 20s, just could not save money. I would buy everything. It was so crazy. And then when I developed the Glenn James spending plan, it was actually designed in a way looking at it to protect me as an impulsive ADHD spender. But within all that, when we do the Glenn James Spending Plan online course, which is free, everyone, you can just Google the Glenn James Spending Plan. It's a free online course. There's a spreadsheet. It actually gives the savers an amount and permission to spend as well. But for people like me, it really helped me um, have all my bills covered, save for the future and spend weekly without any issues and really see money increase. Uh, So, I I, in the online course, I talk about, I woke up one morning, went to the city and bought an Apple Watch with some friends. That was $1,000 or whatever it was, $1,100. That morning, I didn't plan to buy an Apple Watch. So, that's that's an issue. It's also an issue that I had $1,000 just laying around at easy access at the checkout. Um, so that was like one kind of note. And these are kind of just funny things that, and I'm fortunate enough that money has been good in terms of my income. Uh, I've got a really good income. I've, um, I've done well financially, like building a business up and all that, selling it. And, but there's been so much turmoil. And one thing that I think is a a really good word for the last however many years of my life has been this turmoil. And if you are listening to this and you have a diagnosis, it probably makes sense to you. Just, I've lived in chaos, internal internal turmoil. It hasn't been pleasant. What is wrong with me? Like, this is not normal. At the time, it feels normal because it's just you. Another time, we actually had Chelsea Pottinger, Pottinger on the podcast. And in 2018, you know, the more recent spendy things, um, (laughs) she was doing a keynote um, about her story and she was talking about, you know, sleep and the Aura Ring. And during her presentation, I logged onto the Aura Ring website and purchased an $800 Aura Ring, just like that. And then at the time, the sense of urgency I need to buy this right now. This is so crazy. There's just no, I. it's really hard to explain the sense of urgency that I would get with the impulsive spending. Like crazy, 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 crazy. So there's that impulsive spending. And then I've also got this thing happening where, well, if some's good, more must be better. Like absolutely during COVID, You remember, guys, I talked about I'm buying a kayak because I want to go kayaking. This is how dumb this was. I purchased brand new kayak delivered to my house. Not only one kayak, but two kayaks because someone will come with me, won't they? Bought two brand new kayaks, just under two grand or whatever it was, without even thinking about it. The crazy thing was, and this is this whole impulsive, um, not rational, the day the kayaks got delivered, I got home from wrist surgery. Why did I bother buying kayaks three days before when I knew I was getting wrist surgery and I would need to recover before I could use them? This is crazy. End up just selling them or giving them away. I think I gave one away and sold the other. Like, 
it's a waste of money, this impulsive behavior. So not only the, um, you know, impulsive behavior being there, in the background, for many, many years, I would suffer from extreme, extreme boredom. It's like, so crazy. And it's different to depression, and I, I'm treated for that. Um, but yeah, so, oh, as a kid, I just remember being bored so much. Um, you want to hear some other crazy stories? And this is, again, it's, it's an interesting exercise because I'm financially well off and privileged. So, I, I bought that bloody boat that I talk about. While it was getting fixed, I, I'm like, oh, the boat's getting fixed. It's going to be getting a new engine for a couple of months or whatever. It's offline. I went and bought a temporary boat. And I remember the boat was, it was $9,000 and rocked up. I'm like, hey, yeah, we'll, we'll, I'll buy it. Give you eight grand. Yeah, all right. Yeah. <laughs> we took it home. My mates and I, we took it for a run. It was the biggest heap of crap. Two strokes, stank, wouldn't steer so bad. And then I sold it, managed to make $1,500. But this all happened within like a one week period. Like, this is not normal. Like, just don't go buy a temporary boat that's a piece of crap. But then again, I'm like, well, I still want a temporary boat. <laughs> so, I went and bought something a lot better for $25,000 and, um, you know, m- basically sold that for what I bought it for. It wasn't a financial loss, but the whole thing was that impulsivity of buying that first little boat without thinking about it and all that. Um, one thing- um, that has also been a problem, you know, that um, careless mistakes. Oh, I've had a recent issue. Oh, it's just a nightmare. Just like booking stuff, holidays or airline tickets and booking the wrong date and just not double checking, like just careless mistakes, bit of a should be right attitude. Um, so, I mean, there are so many other little financial things that- um, I've just wasted money doing. Like, you just would not believe it. Um, yeah. I don't, like, the impulsivity thing, and this is interesting, like, if I go to a shop and want to buy something, like, yeah, they'll do. I'll get that one. But you haven't looked at all the other things available. I haven't researched it. Um, so, anyway. Just like total financial train wreck. But because I knew that when I did the Glenn James spending plan, I put a system in place that automatically, because I knew that I was really crap, like really, really crap at saving money. Like so, so crap. So, I had to set up different bank accounts and I had to not only set them up as different bank accounts, but with different banks. So, I've got my weekly spend thing that's on my phone that I tap. My other bank, it's not even on my phone. It's out of sight, out of mind. My savings, because what I've learned with the ADHD thing is a lot of it is um, what can be visual stimulation. So, it's like you see something and just... So, if the money's there, oh, the money's there. I, I must spend it. I mean, it's sitting there. It's not doing anything. Yeah, I can save more money another time. This time I'll just spend a you know a couple of thousand dollars on some kayaks that I used twice. Don't know if I mentioned that before. And it's just wild. And then there was this other side of it, right? Where I was uh really learning about, you know, I was saving money and I really wanted to buy one of those sim rigs, racing simulators. And I actually did research this. And was looking around and I started buying all the stuff and a couple of Christmases ago over the holiday season, I purchased it all and set it all up and it was great. Just that thrill of setting it all up. And mind you, I spent $12,000 on buying this sim rig, the computer, three screens because no, no, don't, don't buy a Logitech $100 
steering wheel and put on your desk and just buy a computer game and see if you like playing the game. No, that's crap. Spend $12,000 and buy a sim rig, which is the big metal thing, if you don't know, with the racing seat and it vibrates and all that. Spend $12,000 on a sim rig and just play that. May as well. Awesome. I use the sim rig twice because I was bored. Nah, it's boring playing that. Not doing it. Sold it. What did I sell it for? Eight grand. Second hand. Throwing money away. That was only a couple of years ago. So it wasn't that impulsive. So my whole like 1% thing that I've talked about on the podcast was anything over 1% of my annual income, I've got to sleep on it. So if I earn a hundred grand a year, anything over a thousand dollars, you're sleeping on it. Pick 5%, pick 0.5% rather. Anything over 0.5% of my annual income, if you earn a hundred grand a year, if something comes up and it's $500, you're sleeping on it. Pick $200, pick some type of threshold to protect you. So it, it was, and that was what I've been learning. Like I did have that threshold where I didn't buy the sim rig that was, you know, all the past $12,000 overnight. I was thinking about this for months and this is awesome. Setting it up, you know, put music on. It took me a few days to set it up. Oh, set up. Yeah, I'm done. Fun's gone. Dopamine's worn off. Yeah, I used it. It was kind of fun, but not really into games. Waste of money. So the Glenn James spending plan really did help me because I, I identified that I was a terrible saver. So I had to learn that I would become an amazing investor. And that was to set up my financial life like the financial house that we talk about, we do the foundations, we have all this, and then we allocate money automatically to our investments out of sight, out of mind. My investment properties, principal and interest. I've got the money, might as well pay extra on the investment property for savings, I'll probably spend it. So I became a really good investor. Once money's committed to my investment account, it stays. Once money obviously gets taken out of my account and um, you know, goes into the property, it, it obviously stays. So it's this kind of wild thing. I, I think a lot of people like me, you might be a bit loose on the spendy thing, but often you can be very generous. And, you know, I'm, I'm very generous and I've done a lot of generous things. I haven't done anything generous that was to the detriment of my financial life. But maybe some of the things I shouldn't have done, um, like if I'm in a relationship and, you know, I'll buy someone something extravagant, like $1,000, hey, surprise, here's a new TV or here's a new iPhone. Um, it just doesn't, that's just ridiculous. Just doesn't, in that sense, it's, you don't need to do that. Um, so that's kind of what I've learned. So, Within all this stuff and, you know, they reckon those with ADHD really suffer from emotional regulation. And it's just been very interesting to reflect on relationships and all that stuff. Um, yeah, I don't really want to get into the relationship stuff too much because it's hurtful because uh, you just regret and... Anyway, yeah, I, it's and the, the, I'm going through all this stuff at the moment with like schema therapy and you know looking at um, why I do different things and um, you know the biggest schema thing in schema therapy was insufficient impulse control. That was my biggest thing, and then the coping mechanisms, the coping mechanism for that is withdrawal. I was like, oh my gosh! So this guys. Start of 2024 for me, I've had this huge emotional reckoning. I've had a mental reckoning. I'm learning more about me. ADHD is getting under control, leaning into this schema therapy and uh, the insufficient impulse control, which looks like ADHD is my main schema. And that also has emotional regulation problems. And my life's a train wreck when I look at that, but I'm so happy that 
I'm facing this stuff on like head on now. Um, so it's been a really interesting journey the last few months for me, the ADHD diagnosis. I had another event in my life that it's irrelevant, but it really rocked me mentally and, um, went to the psychologist and working through this schema stuff. So yeah, this is an emotional reckoning for me. Um, so it's just been so wild and I, I kind of, do you talk about this stuff publicly? I guess I am, but if it helps someone, you know, who's got any type of issues, go and talk to someone else. Well, surely I'll be your martyr. <laughs> you know, like I'll put all my crap on the line to help someone else. Um, so that's kind of the only reason I really want to do this for this awareness and the encouragement. Um, and I really appreciate you, Grace, for just letting me chat freely about this stuff. So let's have a look at what the um, the neuropsychologist wrote to um, – actually, we'll have a break and we'll be back and I'll read it right after this because I did all that money wild stuff. So we'll be back right after this. Okay, I'm back. Um, so, yeah, so this is the – ADHD screening assessment report. It's a confidential report. It's got my name, my date of birth. And I said, I'm, I'm, and as, as I said, I'm going to read this pretty much. There's probably only two or three sentences that I won't read, but you'll get the gist of that. Reason for referral. Mr. James is a 39-year-old right-handed male who presented for an assessment with query for ADHD, uh, or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder due to complaints of focus slash concentration, difficulties and impulsivity in his day-to-day -day life. I will say as well, this is anecdotal, but I've heard and seen that bad handwriting, and I talked to the psychiatrist about this, uh, is quite common in those with ADHD and also being like uber flexible. Like I've got so much ligament laxity, it's so wild. Um, Brief psychological, uh, physiosocial, ah, here we go. Brief physiosocial and medical history. Mr. James was born in Australia and reported no delays in meeting de development, developmental milestones. Still can't read. Throughout his schooling, he received, throughout his schooling, he recalled having difficulties focusing in class and said he always found learning in the classroom environment challenging. He described himself as an average student academically. He reported experience, experiencing reading and comprehension difficulties. This is the irony is fascinating. I can't read that probably. During school, but was not diagnosed with any specific learning disorder. He left high school at the age of, uh, at the end of year 11 and subsequently pursued a certificate three in telecommunications, including an, appre an apprenticeship in this field. He then completed both a diploma and advanced diploma of financial planning and a uh, another master's level certification course. Currently, he's completing a certificate two in maritime operations. In terms of employment, he was previously employed as a financial advisor. Currently, he's a podcaster, hosting a successful personal finance podcast for the past six years, where he manages a small team of employees. Additionally, he's authored two books and he's currently working on a third. So, we'll say just, I'll sidebar from that report, there were times where I could have intense focus and hugely intense focus. So, when I wrote the um, Sort Your Money Out book, I went to Queenstown, Queenstown for three weeks straight, got an apartment overlooking the water there, and every day for 10 hour days, just sat there and brain dumped and wrote the book, 120,000 words, basically within three weeks pumped it out. Might've been a week or two at home, but the lion's share of that, solid focus, hyper focus, three weeks straight, 10 to 12 hour days, writing the book. Weird. He reported a longstanding history of anxiety and depression. Should have read this as the podcast. It would have solved a lot of problems. After being more aware of his mental health issues in his early thirties, he sought help from his GP saw a psychologist and began taking venlafaxine, uh, 75 mil 
which he had found very effective in improving his mood and anxiety. Uh, in 2000, I'm just going to skip this. Do, 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 do. Currently, he rarely experiences headaches because I just mentioned I went and got some CT scans a few years ago because I had some headaches, but it was I just had to change medication for the uh, depression and anxiety. He's a teetotaler and a non-smoker. School reports. Mr. James provided school reports from year 7 till 10 to 10. Overall, he was described as a courteous and well-behaved student. However, teacher comments noted that he lacks concentration in class, needs to apply more effort in class and with his homework, is easily distracted in groups and attends class without <laughs> required study materials. Laurel. So, yeah, they basically got all my reports and they had um, my family, like my mum and my sister, um, do a, a questionnaire. What was Glenn like when he was 16? Assessment. Behavioural observations. Mr. James was seen over telehealth for a two-hour assessment and was on time for his appointment. Mind you, my friends, the morning of the 1st of the 11th, when this appointment was, <laughs> I landed in Sydney Airport. Drove straight home two hours, sat down at my desk and clicked go. I was on time, just, because my plane got delayed. I extended my trip anyway. I was impressed that I was on time, just saying, guys. He was friendly, cooperative and engaged well throughout. Mood was reported as good and effect was appropriate. Overall, he focused well throughout, but did appear to become distracted during conversations on a few occasions. He was also quite fidgety throughout. Not overt, expressive or res receptive language difficulties were evident on a conversational level. Self-report symptoms. Mr. James had a range of symptoms in keeping with ADHD, which he described as long-standing and pervasive. Persisting during times of mental wellness. In his leadership position at work, he said that he tends to impulsively change his mind often which adversely affects the workflow and productivity of his team. Sorry, friends, I am working on it. And you know I'm working on it. I'm sorry. He reported. He reportedly often says things without thinking and he's aware of the issue but still finds it challenging to control. In his role as a podcaster, he's mindful of his tendency to interrupt guests, which was a particular issue raised earlier during his podcasting career. He also experiences intense frustration with traffic and cues, especially when feeling on edge. <laughs> Sometimes I know when I'm not right, when I'm so like, hurry up, move. For me, that's a symptom where I'm not at balance if I'm annoyed in traffic. Just my little thing. Don't know if it's relevant to ADHD. Uh, where are we? He reportedly becomes bored easily, both in activities and relationships. He has a pattern of starting projects, such as online courses and hobbies. Amen, brother. Amen. I'm a starter, not a finisher, but struggles to see them through to completion. He also struggles with maintaining a consistent exercise routine. Yeah, boy. He spends <laughs> His spending habits are reportably impulsive, including significant expenditures on tech gadgets like cameras and microphones which he often ends up giving away. It's true. I buy so much crap and give it away. Um, he acknowledged having a strong addiction to his phone and social media, um, noting that he sometimes deletes and reinstalls distracting apps on his phone. He experiences significant uh, difficulty staying focused while reading, like I'm experiencing now, noting that he's easily distracted by other thoughts that excite him prompting him to get up and work on these new ideas. He feels like he lacks productivity, he's easily distracted, and he's prone to procrastination. Though noted, he can lock himself away, quote unquote, and work efficiently when required under time pressures. Diagnostic interview. The diagnostic interview for ADHD in adults, third edition, DIV slash five was conducted with Mr. James. The interview used to ask about the pre uh, the interview is used to ask about the presence of ADHD symptoms 
experienced during both childhood and adulthood. The questions are based on the DSM-5 criteria for ADHD. Number one, attention. Mr. James indicated that the following symptoms were present during childhood and adulthood. Often failing to give close attention to detail or makes careless mistakes. Often has difficulty sustaining attention while completing tasks and activities. Often does not follow through on on instructions and fails to finish work and chores. Often avoids dislikes or is reluctant to engage in tasks that require sustained mental effort. Often easily distracted by extra naeus stimuli. I don't know what that word is. That's a new one. Whatever. Easily distracted, I'll take that as. Number two, hyperactivity slash impulsivity. Mr. James indicated that the following symptoms were present during childhood and adulthood. Often fidgets or taps with hands or feet or squirms in seat. Often feels restless. Often blurts out answers before questions have been completed. Often finds it difficult to wait his turn. Often interrupts or intrudes on others during adulthood but not childhood. Often on the go, acting as if driven by a motor, quote unquote. Age of onset. When asked whether he had these experiences when he was in primary school, he largely endorsed they were present since his childhood years. Impact on functioning. Mr. James identified that his symptoms impact his functioning in work, relationships, and home settings. Test results. Based on his performance on a formal word reading task, Mr. James pre-morbid functioning was estimated to fall in the average range. His basic auditory attention span and auditory working memory were both in the average range. He performed in the extremely low range on speeded color naming, on a speeding color naming task and the borderline range on speeded word reading tasks. That's an interesting one. I've always, you know, that thinking fast, thinking slow thing, You know, if you threw numbers to me like, Glenn, what's 10 plus 10? I'll just like, what? 10 plus 10? How do you expect me to think about that on the fly so fast? I need time to sit down and like, okay, 10 plus 10. Oh, yeah, 20. Um, On a response inhibition task requiring him to inhibit a more salient response, reading the printed word in order to perform a more conflicting task, naming the dissonant ink colors where the words are printed in, he performed in the borderline range on a more complex response inhibition paradigm requiring alternative naming of the ink of a printed word and reading that word he performed in the extremely low range. Mood. On a self-report mood inventory regarding experiences over the past week, his response were consistent with mild levels of anxiety and severe levels of depression and stress. Yeah, I probably was at that time. (laughs) Connors. Mr. James completed the Connors Adult ADHD Scale scale self-report long version to examine features consistent with ADHD as well as other comorbid conditions. He rated himself as being very elevated in terms of hyperactivity, restfulness, can't even read it, restlessness, and mildly elevated in terms of impulsivity and emotional liability. There's a little chart there. Impression. Based on the current assessment, which includes interview, behavioral observations, brief cognitive testing, self-reported ratings, and school records, it is my impression that Mr. James meets diagnostic criteria for attention deficit hyperactive hyperactivity disorder combined presentation. Mr. James has a history of symptoms arising during the developmental period that continue to persist in adulthood. His depression and anxiety are reported to be currently well managed and there is no clear evidence to suggest these issues are significant factors in contributing to his past or current ADHD symptoms. Recommendations. One, Mr. James may benefit from a trial of ADHD medication. Um, Two, pseudo education around the importance of regular exercise in managing the symptoms of ADHD. And there's listed some retail, uh, some resources, blah, 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 signed the clinical neuropsychologist. So, all that to say, I went to the psychiatrist 
and we discussed this report. And he agreed that it uh, may be beneficial for me to try medication, which I did. Uh, that process, and I don't think it even is helpful to name the medication um, because it, you've got to get your own advice, right? It's like if someone's like, oh, what should I invest in? Well, I use this ETF, but it might not be good for you. The thing is you need to invest. You've got to work out what to invest in. It's like, well, I'd benefit from medication. You may as well um, speak to a professional. I don't know. Call me crazy. Um, before that, so he's like, yeah, we'll get you started. And so before that went, had a blood test. I think they just did a usual, uh, full blood count and some other stuff. And I did an ECG as well, which were all clear, went back and talked to the psychiatrist and we started on some short acting medication. And look, it actually has changed my life. Um, I then tried a, another type because we're kind of A, B testing and there was kind of two types of short acting. And I said, I'll take that type. So I did that. And I'm like, oh, I'd be interested to see. So he gave me a small, very small supply of the other type. And then I, I did the first type for like a week. And then the next day did the other time. I was like, oh, wow, I can notice this is actually much better than that one. So that's kind of what we got to. And then I'm kind of like, yeah, I, I think... I'm, so the words that I said to the psychiatrist after this, as a person, when I'm on the medication, I feel more measured and considered and I'm more productive. I was talking to Rach in the team yesterday. We're talking about some stuff. I'm like, as you can notice, now medicated, there are a lot more recordings happening because I can actually function at a really healthy capacity where before my capacity was very, very low, very low. And I could hide that being self-employed, working when I want to work, all this stuff. So it's changed my life. I have been also trying some long acting medication, uh, which stays in my system. It has messed with my sleep a little bit. So I'm going to talk about that with him last time. But what I've basically learned in wrapping up, and I hope this was just helpful um, in you understanding personally what I've been through, because a lot of you listen to me every single week, maybe multiple times a week. And I hope it's helpful um, if you are experiencing some of this weird stuff and it's like, there's a question mark, there's something always been there. Um, and I hope you can maybe speak to your GP and and walk down this road because I think maybe it's like 5% of the population or might have this condition or 10, I'm not sure. Uh, but it's answered a lot of questions for me. And just understanding, like, not going to lie, at the moment, today, I've had my medication and I feel really good. Been doing some deep work. I don't, and this is interesting as well. When I'm on the medication, so when I was recording a podcast, like if I do an hour podcast with someone without the medication, I've got to concentrate so much and really, 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 like it's really hard. Now with the medication, I can pop three deep episodes in a day and not feel exhausted. It's probably the, you know, um, the effective speed in my body, but it's just, it. I don't carry that same mental fatigue after the deep work. I feel accomplished after I get a heap of work done. I feel more, as I said, considered and measured. Um, and as an example, I'm, so my book, Sort Your Money Out uh, and Get Invested, I wrote that in Queenstown. Uh, the publisher, like, we want to do an updated version. I need to go and update a few things. So I'm thinking about so I've put it, I've blocked out my diary in a couple of weeks, like four or five days that I'm just going to work on this. And I'm like, I might go back to Queenstown and work on it there. No distractions and just, but the old Glenn would have instantly booked a ticket to Queenstown, booked it all. And to be honest, at the start of the year, I did this before I was medicated or even the end of last year, I booked another ticket to Queenstown to write the investing book impulsively. 
and then changed my mind and cancelled it. Didn't get a refund on the flight. Like, just crap like that. So bad. So bad. So, now, it's like today, I'll spend the next couple of days actually just thinking about whether I want to book a ticket and go to Queenstown, have a bit of a break, and just work on the book edit itself. So, that in itself, just that being aware that I'm impulsive is because of that actually has helped, just the awareness piece. And also, um, having the medication allows me to get done, get down and get into some deep work. I can now sit down and do some work, either at a cafe or at my desk, three hours straight without a break, two hours probably without him getting up, and time flies so much. And that is life-changing. I said to the psychiatrist, far out, I wish I had that when I was in my early 20s. And he said, no, that w- it probably wouldn't have been helpful because you may have been stuck in a, a desk job where you're quite entrepreneurial and you needed to take those risks and you wouldn't be here today if you didn't. So, it was this like weird thing. But now that my career and business is established, it is now this more, I've got a tool now. The first tool is I'm aware of what's happening in my body and why I might be impulsive. And then secondly, I've got a tool which I can take as a medication and keep me focused, keep me measured. To be honest, side effects, haven't really noticed any, which is good. And yeah, so look, it's been a long and winding road. Um, I think I've kind of covered everything and I I really apologize that this was a bit haphazard. I just didn't know really how to do this episode. Um, But, hey, like I say, it's worth what you paid for it. We'll leave it there. Please, if you are listening to this and you're in any um, maybe ADHD groups or um, follow Instagram pages, it might be helpful to share to people um, as a tool that they can share with others um, if they need an honest account of the process. Um, so yeah, please feel free to share it. Um, will I regret reading my confidential report publicly? I mean, probably, but I didn't really, I I took out some, like, I didn't read some stuff that was heaps confidential, but I'm, as I said, if it helps one person see a doctor and get some answers or particularly you might be listening to this and your spouse or partner has these type of issues, it's, um, yeah, it's just a PSA, everyone. And uh, I'm not, like, I'm actually not unlike anyone else. I'm just the same as everyone. Just so happens I've got a big podcast and platform, but the Glenn talking on this podcast or pl- like platform to maybe thousands and thousands of people, he's still Glenn when he like goes and sits on the lounge night and watches Netflix and catches up with friends and goes out. Like, I am not above anything and I'm just a person like you. Um, so, yeah, we'll uh, we'll leave it there. Although I was going to say one last thing. Mm, nah. Be good. I'll see you soon.